A very good evening and a very warm welcome to our brand new episode of VAI Master Series with our experts. These series are conducted in collaboration with Venus Association of India, our knowledge partner, under the guidance of Dr. Harinder Singh Bedi. Today's discussion will be on legal aspects of informed surgical consent. And for this, we have with us Dr. Jayant Das. Uh, welcome, sir. Um, he is a dialysis access and peripheral vascular surgeon and a medical legal expert as well. He's a renowned medical legal expert and, uh, and the former medical director of Nehru Memorial Techno Global Hospital. He's also an executive committee member of the Venus Association of India, an ethical committee member of the Sister Florence College of Nursing, and the vice president of the Indian Academy of Medical Legal Experts. Dr. Das has also served as a faculty at the Bharat Center of Canada and Health Editor at uh, Samoyer Kobar. He's, he's the General Secretary of the Delon's um, Kidney Foundation and the Director of Delon's Medical Legal Consultancy Services. Absolute pleasure to have you with us here, sir. Over to you for the discussion. Uh, thank you, Darshika. Uh, it's a very pleasure for me and nice meeting all of you guys. And a special thanks on behalf of BAI that you are taking this effort to percolate knowledge. And special regards for Dr. H.S. Bedi, actually, who initiated this process to collaborating with your uh, institution and organization. So, shall I start from our today's discussion? Yes, sir. Just let me know once it is visible. Yeah, so the screen is visible. You can make it full screen. Uh, very warm welcome uh, for all those who are basically attending this online uh, academic session. Uh, though I am a vascular surgeon, but today's topic is a little bit of different. And as a surgeon, we always take consent and we are very keen to take consent in a proper way, how much to be done and what not to be done. Or today's discussion is depending on that. And to begin with, if I ask somebody uh, what exactly consent means uh, in our day-to-day -day practice, it means that before any surgical procedure, there is a printed form and names written there. We write their procedural names, etc., etc., signed by the treating doctor and sometimes the patient himself or herself or somebody as a representative of the patient do sign that particular form and that is called consent. Ladies and gentlemen, that's true. We are practicing in that way. And there are many hospitals has designed it in their own way. Now, the most common consent form in all the major hospitals we do encounter, that is one standardized form, which is probably guided by the many of the NABH, SSR, and NABH consultants. Today, we'll ta take you through a journey how this consent is being taken, what are the legalities, and one doctor should know when to do it, how to do it, and how it can be utilized for his benefit if this is ultimately lands up in any kind of court of law. Why today we are discussing this in this forum uh, 50 years back when doctors are treated as God. So whatever they say, it is directly uh, communicated for, from the God. But today, scenario is completely different. Consumerism is at its peak, and every service and everything, whatever is technologically and demanding profession like medicine, is a huge amount of technology, interpersonal skills, as well as the surgical skills. Is there, but there is a scenario and atmosphere of mistrust. At the same time, many other forces, including the economic and political forces, are playing into their own role in the society for various specifically designed procedures and specifically designed their attitude and approach so that it can give some kind of mileage to that particular entity. Being a doctor, it is always, almost always, it's an individual ball game. So as a doctor, we have to prepare ourselves how we can survive in this situation. I am going back to the initial days of our medical science when a patient came to a doctor for his own treatment and doctor is providing treatment. 
now in most of the scenarios patients are coming to institutions or hospitals and at the same way doctors are giving the treatment but this hospitals is a microeconomical scenario if you come to a corporate institution then this institution is for various kind of designs but ultimate motive is the profit and if you go to a government setup yes there is also a motive of profit but it's not directly in terms of money it is how better or how bigger community can be served so healthcare scenario though it is a microeconomy as a doctor you and me belong in that microeconomical scenario it is always guided and influenced by the macroeconomical scenario starting from the social elites to the population so health economy health industry has their direct or indirect influence in all these three parameters even if today some patient comes to my chamber he will ask i saw this was in youtube and google is saying this and that so that means they are also being influenced by the information available in the internet or from the various sources so it is not the same scenario which was 100 years or 1000 years back so according to the scenarios we need to change ourselves in a little bit way and at the same time we have to understand whatever our ancestors taught us that medicine has a profession and it has its own autonomy we are very proud about professional autonomy but believe me there is no such terminology ever described in any of the legal textbook what exactly this professional autonomy is it doesn't exist that's the truth so little bit a quick look of what exactly concept of professional autonomy though it's not a legal entity it means we are professing to the public to the god for their betterment and this profession is having certain characters it is a public mission which should be selfless back with the advanced knowledge and technology there will be code of ethics there will be specifically designed license to practice and there is autonomy this autonomy is misrepresented in various medical forum as professional autonomy it doesn't work in that way what exactly it is world medical association is a association of doctors it was started in talking about this professional autonomy in 1987 in madrid then we should be very proud about it in in the year of 2009 they actually came up with this kind of concept of professional autonomy they actually i am praising this declaration of madrid on professionally led regulation they actually now uttered the terminology called professional autonomy they have classified what we should do and what we should not do as a doctor this is a long list i made this a very simple many doctors do ask me if i charge 1000 rupees for my opd charges or 10000 rupees my opd is that any kind of violation of law the answer is no it is a freedom of existing exercise of clinical judgment essential principle of clinical ethics right of physicians responsibility of self regulation responsibility of professional development care is the primary focus cost consciousness is essential but it is designed or proposed for the patients not for the doctor himself so if you say that 1000 and 10000 if we uh, make up of war then probably 1000 will won the race because it is more society friendly so professional autonomy is a collective phenomena of the doctors or group of doctors or group of professionals not a individual doctor per se last but not the least please do remember in legal world there is nothing called professional autonomy do you think that you can do whatever you feel like it's not like that we can't do this as a professional we are trained to do how to do the healthcare what best we can offer to our patient so professional autonomy is a collective phenomena it's not a individual phenomena this is fundamental truth of professional autonomy so we have to be very cautious and careful whenever we are talking about our professional autonomy and 
directly or indirectly, it will be dictated by the economical equilibrium of the society you do belong. Say, for example, uh, if somebody is a doctor in NHS, that means UK, whatever the salary structure they are getting, the same salary structure is not, you cannot think about in India because our economical situation is a little bit of different. So it is some way, directly or indirectly, equilibrium is there and it will be calibrated by the economic scenario, the society you are serving. That is how the professional autonomy is being understood in the real world. So what as a doctor we should do? We should try to make ourselves as perfect as possible. So we have to have do our clinical practice. Otherwise, uh, we cannot survive because that's our bread and butter. So we have three major parameters of our own practice. One is clinical practice. It is It should be ethical and it should be legally correct. If we can combine these three in an equilibrated manner, then we will brand ourselves. So as a doctor, we I you know, cannot say that you should advertise on your own. But at the same time, if you do your job in a proper way, if you do your clinical practice with proper expertise in an ethical way and legally manner, indirectly and indirectly, it will give you your own branding. Then you will be somebody who will be known by the society, starting from your patients, your peer colleagues, and the society at a large. So we have to do something in a professional manner. Professional, uh, it's a very commonly used term who exactly the professional is. It's not doctor, it's not engineers. Professional is an adjective. It means a person having four qualities. Read it very carefully four qualities. The person having the capability to do the right work at the right time, in a right way, last but not the least, with the right outcome. Whatever efforts you put, if you could not succeed, it won't be termed as a good professional. So we have to do something satisfying these four things, four rights, right work at right time, in a right way, having the right outcome. So in our scenario, it is the proper treatment, proper schedule, and satisfying the parameter that is the clinical, ethical, and legal parameter. Subsequently, it will be your branding parameter too. An outcome is patient is cured and happy. Whatever we have done, if the patient is not happy or patient died, that means these parameters all are not properly satisfied. So that is how we should do understand and we should do a way so that we can satisfy all these parameters. And that is the reason we are discussing today as a surgeon, what is the legalities and technicalities of a surgical consent. Now, there is a terminology or tagline in management. It is what can be measured that can be managed. So if you have to do something, we need to know that what exactly it is. As a doctor, we have specifically designed professional liability, but it doesn't mean as a citizen, whatever other fellow citizen do have the liability, I do not have, it's not like that. The professional liability is over and above the liability of a independent citizen of India. Our professional liability is has three different steps. One is the liability to the governments, next is that to the authority, the hospital I do work or you do work, and liability towards the patients. In general, liability of doctors, we do refer liability towards the patient. But now it is an extreme point. Even Lancet came out with a chapter or with a publication that we must protect patients, but we must also find better ways to protect our professionals. If we do not, medical progress will cease, particularly in controversial and distressing areas. So we need to build our own strategy to protect ourselves from all other forces which actually dictate the medical or professional practice. So it, now we are concising to the medical practice which is dedicated or designed for patient benefit. Why we are so much aware of the legalities and legal issues in today's world? Because now we are dragged into the various forum or various court, so we need to be legally correct also. In 100 years back, there was no litigation. There was doctor-patient relationship, yes, 
I, I am not saying that is absolutely equilibrated or that is the absolute good thing. But at the changing scenario with the socio-legal and socio-political scenario, including the economic scenario, patient and as a common citizen, they have also changed. Now it's time to change the doctors also. I am coming to a common reference. In 50 years back, probably only a handful of Indian citizens were using a mobile phone. Now, almost everybody has a smartphone. So society has changed, but doctors do not keep pace on this kind of social scenarios and changes because they are always busy in the treating patients or if somebody is a surgeon for doing his own surgery. And they think that it is not my cup of tea. Yeah, you can feel it or you can think about it. But if you are, if you stuck, then nobody will be there to help you. Everybody is there for their own job. But one wrong can lead in many forums. It can be in the consumer forum, civil court, criminal court, medical council, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Human Rights Commission. In case of West Bengal, where I do stay, there is one entity called CERC, Clinical Establishment Regulatory Commission. And there are a few other things. It's like PCP, NDT, THOA. If you are involved as a practitioner with organ transplantation, yes, you have to understand the PCP in detail and THOA. And there is media, public, and hospital authority, and definitely few allies. It, it, this allies means economic or political allies, or you, in a broader way, you can say the social allies. You, you may like it, you may not like it, but you cannot ignore it. So we have to take consideration of everything so that we can design in our proper way. Now, in a real world, what exactly happens? You have done a treatment, something goes wrong, or patient died, or patient is not happy. They take all the papers and then go to any of the forums for the litigation. And what exactly there will happen? There, uh, there will be a lot of trials. That means whatever paper submitted by the patient and the relatives, and the re reply is sent by you or your lawyer. And there is evidence and witness. This cycle will go on. And at some point of time, there will be judgment. This judgment is to balance the things. You may lose the case or you may win the case. To understand the legalities, your probability of first the prevention of litigation will be higher. And even if, if you are stuck in any kind of litigation, probability of winning will be on the higher side. If you do understand the legalities, and if you play accordingly, what exactly needs to be done to look is a legally or technically correct manner. I am coming to in a now we are actually approaching to our today's topic, which is actually surgical consent. If a surgeon does a surgery without consent, that means no consent. So it can have it's a one incident that one surgeon operated without consent it can have minimum three deleterious effect in his profession one it will be tried in the professional regulation if that is the medical council now it is an mc so there could be suspension even deregistration that is professional death sentence deregistration is equivalent to death or hanging in in criminal law but professional deregistration means it is the death sentence of a professional. That means from that point of the time of verdict, you are not a doctor or recognized doctor in India. You cannot practice in India. So it's a professional death sentence. And civil and CPA and tort, they will, there will be damages. That means the compensation. And in criminal law, if it is tried and you prove wrong, then it, there will be fine, jail, or both. So one mistake can have this consequence, any one of them or any of the combination. That is the problem with medicine. One incident can be tried in multiple forum with a multiple background and their consequences is multiple. You cannot say it is being tried in MCI or in MC, it can't be tried in civil or criminal court. It's not like that, it can't happen. So it can be tried each and every forum wherever the patient and the relatives are entitled to go under Indian law. So we need to understand and design. Doctor-patient relationship is actually starts with the relation of doctor and patient. 
when a patient come to doctor's chamber, doctor has specifically three duties. One decision that whether I am going to take this patient or not. Say I am a surgeon. One patient came with abdominal swelling and she is saying that I am pregnant. Now it is my decision as a surgeon whether I am trained to handle pregnancy or not. This can be any other situation. You are, as a professional, you are free to take decision whether I am taking this patient or not. Until and unless there is life-saving emergency, you have every right to refuse a patient or you don't need to even show any reason. So taking or not taking the first step of duty, if you take this patient, then diagnosis and advice of treatment is the next responsibility, next duty towards the patient. Last but not the least is the administration of the treatment. It is also the doctor's responsibility who is treating doctor or treating physician. Clubbing together these three is duty of care. Administration of treatment is always, always, always is the responsibility of a treating physician. Now I am saying one scenario. Say I am a surgeon and uh, somebody admitted under me and my junior operated on him and something went wrong. I cannot go to the court and say I haven't operated my team or my junior has operated on, on the particular patient. So I, I cannot be penalized. It's not like that. If I am allowing one of my junior or one of my staff to do something, so onus is on me. If anything goes wrong, liability will be on me. This is specifically termed as vicarious liability in law. So don't think if the patient is under you and is treated by somebody else and something goes wrong, but liability will be on your shoulder, not somebody who actually has done that one. So this is how duty of care is explained in Indian law scenario. This has two different components. One is the quality quotient and another is the legal quotient. Quality quotient we do understand what to do and what not to do, but legally it is because doctors are poorly understood and doctors are poorly qualified in law, so they do not understand what are the legal quotients. It means without deficiency of service, maintaining patient's rights, human rights, and all other rights provided him or her by Indian law. It starts from constitution to various specific laws. So we have to satisfy all that laws during rendering our service. That is important and we have to respect it. In law, we do hear one term, it's called reasonable care. If the legal component and the quality component is satisfying, then this is called reasonable care. So all the legal forum, wherever there is a litigation, this term is being used, reasonable care, which means the care of the medical segment and it is satisfying all the laws in force at that point of time. Informed consent came in this case whenever we are basically administrating our treatment. We have to inform the patient. Now we are going into the depth of understanding the informed consent. As a surgeon, it's not just a printed format to fill in the blanks. I am coming into the details how this should be technically and legally correct, which can stop even, even if there is a litigation, it can help you to save your own back. What we exactly know about consent, surgeons do understand only preoperative consents. Yes, they are right because that is their routine work and every day they encounter with surgical consent, but it is not the end of the list. There is a long list of consent. End of life decisions, yes, there are consents. Advanced directives, yes, there are consents. Clinical trial, medical research, everywhere there are a set of consents and basic rules are same, but segment-wise, the technicality-wise, it differs from one type of consent to another type of consent. We, as a surgeon, 
we have to understand that consent is a big platform or big thing. From that big thing, we need to verbatimly understand what the surgical consent is. So it is basically patient has an autonomy. Doctors also have their autonomy and expertise. The patient is giving permission to the doctor to perform examination, investigation, therapy, or any kind of procedure. It can be implied if somebody comes to my chamber, that means he or she willing to be examined by me. So it is an example of implied consent. If some procedure has to be done, then it has to be expressed consent for documentation purpose, which is a legal entity for both the parties of a consent taking procedure. So it could be verbal, gestural, written, surrogate, proxy. Now in, in the era of telemedicine, e-consent is also there. We'll come across into that. But most commonly, we do have the written consent. Almost every surgeon do practice with the written consent. So we, our discussion will be mainly focusing how to do the written consent and how we can do best possible service to the patients at the same time we can save ourselves so this consent is basically documentation of shared decision making now we are coming to informed consent we are not going into the details of history how surgical consent came into the principle but we have to understand the principle is voluntary non-fit injuria it is mentioned in the laws of tort and IPC 87. IPC stands for Indian Penal Code. It means the person has the knowledge of the risk. The person with the knowledge of the risk has voluntarily agreed to suffer that harm. This is exactly meaning of voluntary non-fit injuria. The principle of any kind of consent is this one voluntary non-fit injuria. Now we are talking about consent, but our topic is informed consent. So there is, is this same or is this a little bit of different thing or completely different thing? It is completely different thing, but we do not understand. Consent is a terminology came from contract act. Whenever two major, that means two adults, are negotiating on something and came to a common agenda, they are in contract. And this contract is guided by Indian Contract Act 1872. So consent came from Contract Act. Now there is one terminology, informed consent. Are from this informed claim? Yes, it, it, it is not from the Contract Act. Informed consent came from laws of tort. This informed means one party is being involved, informed, and he should be understanding what exactly is the information. Why this kind of thing? As a surgeon, whatever expertise I do have, I have the expert knowledge, one patient or their relatives may or may not have that kind of expertise usually not so it is my responsibility to make him understand in his or her own language so understanding is very important it came from laws of tort burden is on the doctor until and unless it is specifically mentioned it is the burden on the shoulder under whom the patient is admitted it means helping the patient to decide whether to accept that process, whatever is proposed, or not accept this. As per design, we have to provide six specific information to the patient regarding informed consent, clinical condition, proposed management, and risk involved in the proposed management, possible outcome of the management, possible complications, any alternative management is possible or not effect if no treatment is done. So informed consent should have these six paras, these six information. If some of the informed consent or consent form doesn't have these six, 
that means it is not a properly done informed consent. It may be satisfying the parameters of consent under contract act, but not satisfying the informed component, which is dictated by the laws of tort. So take home messages, consent is a process. It's not just signing a document. Yes, it is a contract. Any consent is person and procedure specific. Those who are doctors, it is for them. Say, for example, uh, I am taking or referring one common scenario. Lab pull is a very commonly performed procedure. If you are a surgeon and if you are doing a lab pulley, that means one consent is for lab pulley. In the evening round, you found that there is uh, maybe some bile leakage. Though you need to relook or re-laparoscopic procedures, whether you have to take a next consent or not, the answer is yes. Consent is always person and procedure specific. Here the person is same, but procedure is completely different. So consent taking is a process and it is a person and procedural specific. It is a patient's rights and legal safety net for the doctors if they can utilize it in a proper way or they can keep it in a proper way. It is always a documentary evidence. I am not going into the details of the literature. One line have to understand, vox or it, take it and litera scriptura manage. It means the law of evidence recognizes superior credibility of documentary evidence as against oral evidence. Usne bol diya tha, maine kar diya or if somebody comes with a document that is signed by both the parties, so documents will have the higher weightage in court of law. Informed consent is a contract, came from the Contract Act. It has three different things, promise, agreement, and contract. Now we have to understand the elements of informed consent or elements of the valid contract, it should satisfy the 11 points. In this six number point is very important, the free consent, that is the patient is not under any kind of stress or threat. It is very confusing for doctors because if somebody is sick, say for example, if somebody having cancer and you as a surgeon going to operate, then definitely he will be under stress. Nobody can be in a, relaxing mode knowing that i have cancer and tomorrow i will be i will be operated by some surgeon then how to satisfy this one in medical context this free consent means to be operated or not to be operated you cannot force or you cannot influence other than citing anything of that particular disease say for example if this patient is already given some sort of sedative, now this patient is signing consent. So you are at fault because sedatives can hamper his neurological function. So it might help his decision-making procedure. So usually this kind of consent should be taken before the patient is admitted. Though in Indian law or any of the law text, it is no, nowhere mentioned the exact timing of taking consent. So free consent, don't be confused if you are a surgeon. You should not influence by explaining any other thing other than the disease concern. That is the free consent in surgical practice. <clears throat> there are many rights of the patients. It is the patient's charter. If you go to the website of the uh, our Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, there are 17 rights written one patient do enjoy. These rights are basically derivatives from constitutional rights, human rights, and various other laws. In this rights, fourth point is right to informed consent. So all the surgeons are bound to take informed consent. Our constitution in Article 21 mentioned about the informed consent. So it also gives them the right to refuse. So after being informed, patient may decide or choose not to proceed with the proposed management. They have every right. So Article 21 gives them right to be informed. At the same time, the same information, set of information, set of situation, they have the right 
to refuse the treatment. So Article 21 serves these two purposes. There are many medical ethics situations. Consent is mentioned in everywhere. Before performing an operation, uh, the physician should obtain the consent in writing, et cetera, et cetera. There are a long list to making the long story short. Before the procedure, it consent should be taken and patients should not be victimized or misinformed of the ethics regulation actually focuses on these three factors. It is a safety net for doctors because if I do harm to anybody, so I have knife. Yes, I am a doctor. Uh, many times, even my briefcase having the surgical knife, but I cannot go and uh, cut anybody's skin. So it is a safety net. And it is written. Section 87 of IPC, it is said, a person above 18 years of age can give consent to suffer any harm if the act is not intended and not known to cause death or grievous hurt. So surgeons have safety net on a IPC 87. IPC 92, what exactly says, if in any kind of dire necessity situation or life-saving situation, if the patient is not in a position to provide consent, if the doctor is doing something on good faith to save the patient, there is no liability. In that situation, no patient consent is required. So it is an emergency medical situation where consent taking is not possible. In a life-saving emergency, doctors can perform on the best interest of the patient, whatever they feel like to do for the best interest or best survival opportunity of that particular patient. One very important question is who can give consent? There are a long list. In general, patient himself, if kids, parent or legal guardian, authority can give consent. Both the spouse in case of serialization, both the spouse and donor for ART, it's the artificial reproductive technology. Only wife now after this amendment, any woman. If it is a situation of MTP, one woman without asking any question, whether she is married or not, whether she has any boyfriend or not, she can go and ask for MTP if other parameters are there. So single woman consent for MTP is absolutely fine under Indian law. Authorized legal rep representative, court or law, definitely. Uh, we all have experiences in emergency department that uh, after somebody is being arrested, police taking him to a hospital. So in that situation, if the uh, somebody who is arrested, he says, no, I am not going to uh, for this medical examination, he cannot say no. It is enforced by the law or by the police. The doctor's job is here to assist the law enforcing agencies or assist the judicial proceedings. So in that situation, patient himself, whether the, he gives consent or not, it doesn't matter. Eligibility, in general, 18 years, it is as per the Contract Act and IPC, but in IPC 80 and 90, it is written as 12 years. So it is better if the patient is more than 12, also include his or her legal heirs or parents or somebody who is senior to them. And if more than 18, then it is absolutely fine to give single consent. Preliminary condition, soundness of mind, ability to understand, remember the information given, ability to deliberate and decide and treatment choices freely, otherwise not disqualified by law. There is one situation, just we are referred to that, that police is taking one accused for a medical examination, he cannot say no, so otherwise not disqualified. Whatever the parameters of consent is applicable as a person like you and me, it is not same somebody who is under arrest. So there is a little bit different. Regarding timing, nowhere it is mentioned at what exact time the consent should be taken for surgery, but in general, it should be taken before commencement of the procedure and consent is over. 
the authority of doing something on that particular patient it terminates at the point of at the moment of when the procedure is over so before commencement in my suggestion if possible before admission of the patient if that not possible in many of the day care situations then before giving any sedatives uh, i do practice a simplistic way i don't prescribe any sedative in the night before so you can adopt according to your own practice there are few situations when patient's consent is not required there are legal entities it is described in indian laws medical legal cases brought by police this is one situation consent is not required in medical examination issue of certificate for insurance policies if you want to take a say one crore term plan so you have to go through a medical test nobody uh, asking you for any kind of consent because insurance company is basically dictating your this kind of you need to go through this and that test so in this kind of scenario patient's consent is not required there are many lo long list life saving emergency is a medical consent for doctors one important catch line there is no situation where no consent is required every situation where consent is required it may be directly by the patient or maybe somebody else we just discussed about the medical emergency life saving situation the legal interpretation is as a doctor you have taken the decision to proceed to save the life of that particular patient when nobody is around and patient is not in a situation to give his own consent it means you are consenting on behalf of the patient for the benefit of the patient in life saving emergency it is the consent by the treating doctor so there is no situation it's still clear in indian law no situation where no consent is required few situations are there patient's consent is not required but somebody else somebody other than the patient is giving consent the consent is required always always and always there should not be any kind of ambiguity in our surgical consent there is a various kind of pro forma we do encounter but please make sure this format is maintained or not there has to be patient's detail date time place consenting person details doctor details and the points procedure name and details specific information that is the clinical condition proposed management and risk involved we have already discussed it other details here you can write whatever you feel like and miscellaneous i will come into details why this is very important and most likely most of the printed format we do not see these things uh, why i do not know consenting person sign doctor signature last but not the least without witness consent is incomplete because whatever we are writing and signing it is the contract form between the doctor and the patient there has to be a witness minimum two witness but one is okay two i am saying because it is written in the contract act any contract any any kind of agreement should have two witness that's the reason i am recommending you though in medical consent no i specifically mentioned how many witness we do require at least one if possible to make it a habit or make column witness number 1 witness number 2 so that you cannot miss and these things are not i haven't came across any of the printed consent form the limitation and liability clauses i will come back with this particular limitation and liability clauses before we finish our today's presentation so in this telemedicine era yes there are e contracts are there whenever we do use facebook or anything anything any online platform you we see i agree and it is being documented all these are form of e, -con e consent or e contract form doctors many doctors do practice telemedicine 
but unfortunately, most of them never read it, what actually written in this e-contract form. I will recommend if you are interested in telemedical practice, please do read, go through it. You won't be able to bypass that manatodinidekata. This won't stand in the court of law. Any document, consent is a document, but this is a fundamental rules of any kind of medical document. So we will discuss this in relevance with surgical consent. What exactly in real life scenario we do encounter? We do write uh, name of the patient, their age, sex, etc. Either if you are a busy practitioner, some of your ass assistant is filling that name, age, sex, etc., etc. Now complainant details, it is written by the doctors. Comorbidity written by the doctor. History, surgery, etc. written by the doctor. Previous documents, it is also documented by the doctor. Where is financial details? In most of the scenarios, we do not take any financial details. Now, what exactly next happen? We will note down the examination and investigation. Treatment that, okay, you need lab coli or whatever it is. Patient may refuse, but how to document it? Most of the uh, scenarios we do not understand. And there are various kind of certificate, most commonly encountered certificates, the discharge certificates. Now, if you think about the scenario, real life scenario, whatever patients say, it's until proven otherwise, almost always a verbal communication. But whatever a doctor has been done, it is almost always a written communication. So whatever is there as a document, it is heavily, not heavily, probabilistically almost 100% is created by the doctor. Say one scenario, uh, patient said uh, and uh, something you diagnosed uh, appendic appendicitis and operated on, on it and do usual things. Now somehow this patient is not satisfied and there is some complications and in this case go to litigation. Patient in front of judge can say, Sahab, ham to baya tarap pe dard bola tha. Ham ko to nahi malum doctor sahab ne kya likha. Ham ko to angrezi bhi nahi aata hai. Doctor sahab ne bola bhatti ho jao. Operation kar lo. Ham to kar liye. Can you change this situation? In current scenario, what doctors are actually doing in their own practice, it is almost impossible to negate this. One situation is there if it is recorded in video video recorded consent yes it is possibility but it is very difficult to video record things where you will keep so much of data only very big hospitals can have this kind of facility otherwise not yes most many of the hospital i i think most of the hospital do have cctv but have you ever came across to the recording room it is only the footage you cannot hear anything. Most of the CCTVs cannot record the sound or whatever somebody actually expressed or said. So video consenting is a mechanism. We can try it, but routinely it is not available in all the time. So we need to ask the patient, whatever is verbal from the patient's side, make it writing or ask them to write in their own language will help you in many ways we will come into the in the discussion pen and whatever we write as a doctor modify this say for example i am coming to a very basic level law says it should be a shared decision making so somebody has uh, come across and diagnosed with the cholecystitis so i have as prescribed that uh, admit on ato for left is this a established or shared decision making? Most of the doctors do write in this way. I, I, I see almost every day few litigations. Now we can write this in a technically correct way. If you agreed with the proposed management of lab coli, please get admitted in this hospital on such and such date for such and such operation. Just add this line, if you agreed with the proposed management, it is in the OPD setup. The patient will be admitted in the next two or three days. 
now this document is sufficient to establish it is a shared decision making not a authoritarian command go and admit so this is how we can modify our writing so that we are doing the same thing but more legally correct manner we have to learn this start another thing we can add because the two autonomies are basically fighting patient's autonomy and definitely there is doctor's autonomy so there we need to make certain hurdles or mechanism so that this kind of conflict we can minimize i cannot say that if you apply things it will be zero but yes definitely we can give an effort to make things as minimum as possible so we are thinking about the litigation or vandalism in a hospital that means extreme point of any kind of dispute res resolution dispute resolution mechanism there are many mechanism is that the legally accepted mechanism discussion negotiation mediation arbitration then litigation and force force though force is not legal if two contracting parties are doing something but force is legal if court is doing that or police is doing that so we can involve these steps in our consenting mechanism say for example have you ever seen that somebody is fighting with a against a newspaper with some kind of defamation case yes you can find but one in 10 year incidence is too low why because this group of the print media world they have made one body it's not a legal body i'm sorry it's not it's not illegal it is a legal association i am trying to say it's not a statutory body or made under any specific act it's a legal body legal entity is basically association as we do belong in bai venus association of india it is something like that its members are various kind of media houses what the name is advertising standards council of india they made certain rules and regulation if you want to file a case directly to court it is not possible you have to route it through them we can learn from this mechanism how we can make our consent so that if anything goes wrong it has to go through discussion negotiation mediation and arbitration channels if time fades away then definitely anger and other parameters are also phasing away why people are going or rushing to the cpa consumer forum because it is the instant money take it from me anybody is filing a case against you only two parameters somebody is personally anti or want to squeeze money cpa gives quick retrieval quick money that's the reason most of the people goes to cpa well, most of the cases actually land up in the cpa because from there they can get money You, you, if we can do or make certain amount of mechanism to so number of litigation, definitely do, there will be a less number. I cannot again, I cannot say it's zero, but yes, definitely we can minimize uh, the number of litigations, and definitely it's a pastel dependent. There are many factors we do consider a gadi patient. Yeah, okay, it's a little sasthe company ka dawai do. So we modify, but we modify only in kind of clinical setup. we do consider patients but only for clinical way but at the same time it's now time that we should take care of the legal component we have to fix our target it is the clinical expertise it has to be legally and ethically correct patient should be happy and our life should be hassle free so we need to be very smart this smart doesn't mean it's street smart it's smart is basically meaning we need to do specific measurable achievable realistic and time bound steps so that our practice and our life can be hassle free so we have to be smart it's time to be smart because smarter people are always rule the world it, it's not the some good people not like that real world doesn't work in the that way so we have to hybridize our techniques with the science arts and commerce how we can take the best possible surgical consent 
informed consent so that it can satisfy all the parameters what actually we are discussing for. So we have to take consent by modifying in various ways. What exactly we do, because if we need to make certain changes, so we have to start what we exactly have at this moment. So consent has one physical parameter that is it is printed in certain amount, certain paper, whatever, some kind of paper works. Mental, that is patient should be understanding after discussing with me or I am informing him as a surgeon. And the social law has defined certain things, what I should do and I should not do. So I have to categorically fix these things. I have written or made this slide with this physical, mental and social component because we all are from healthcare industry. We do understand these terms in very crystal clear way because we are doctors. We started our career by the definition of health. It is a physical, mental and social well-being. So what if this same thing, just replicate in the consent, physical form is there is a paper and ink. The mental form is your clinical expertise, which will be judged by the colleagues and social parameters will be judged by the society or power axis. That means elites, law, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, definitely finance is important. So for the paper and ink, we can think about technology. For the clinical expertise, yes, we have to uplift and we have to stop backbiting one surgeon to another. We need to cooperate and definitely legally correct way. So we have to understand how if you go to, to a lawyer, you know there are many murders in the city everywhere. Crime is not zero, but how many murder case is actually convicted? How many rape case actually convicted? or hanged, why? Because they know how to manipulate the law. So it is not the correct thing to be good. It is the rational thing, be good at the same time, look good and do good in a good way so that you can have your own practice. So it's a multi-dimensional factors. We need to modify our health as well as the health of our consent taking mechanism. That is the way towards uh, our healthy practice. Last but not the least, I will end with this slide. I am a doctor. I do practice to earn my own living. I, I am scared about all these things, uh, litigation and all that, because I do not understand this is one parameter. And another parameter is uh, my earning is dependent on me. If I do not work or one doctor, is not being able to work, you won't get this basic bread and butter. So design thinking is another concept, though it is not very prominent in the medical world, more prominent in the business world, in the management world. Think about it. We need mechanisms by which we can earn from other avenues other than doctoring, other than your own profession, where from we can earn little bit so that if you are not being able to work, still your life will be sustainable. It's a complete financial education. We are not going into the details. Remember this seven R formula. There are rate and remuneration. Doctors are in these two categories. This is the personal efforts and time dependent mechanisms, but rest is a system generated where your personal time expertise and efforts is nullified. It's not dependent on your personal efforts. It is a replication, rent, royalty, rights, and returns. That's it. That's all for the today. If there is any question, please feel free. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Das. Um, insightful presentation, and thank you for all the examples and cases that you discussed. We have received a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, so let's begin. Um, my first question is uh, from Dr. Bedi himself. He says, should we use thumbprint also? Um, as some delative can say that, you know, it, it is not his or uh, her signature at all. Uh, to the Bedi sir, with best of my regards, yes, if we can use thumbprint, that is absolutely fine. It is a legally valid thing. But before uh, taking thumbprint, I will recommend few other mechanisms by which 
this can be uh, these issues can be minimized we are afraid of patients relatives what is the reason the reason is if one patient is admitted and there are 10 phone calls or 10 patient relatives coming on every day so first we have to make certain mechanism so that these phone calls getting reduced or if 10 relatives are coming to meet me, ask about the patient's condition, we can reduce. Two mechanisms already doctors do, but this is particularly a healthcare mechanism. It's a medical-like mechanism. One is your phone is diverted to your junior or handed over to junior or whatever phone number is provided, this is a junior sum. This is one mechanism we always do. There is another mechanism you can make a big timing. Now, just recapitulate things. These things, I can make a mechanism which will make it is just only one person. How to do it? For that, we need to understand a little bit of other things of law. This is a very important thing, patient's rights. In patient's rights charter, if we go, we will see there is a patient's confidentiality and privacy it's given one of the highest important in the patient's rights. What exactly it says? Until and unless patient is giving consent, you cannot divulge any medical thing to any other person. It means that we can curtail this almost to one person if we play accordingly. Even we curtail, it is almost zero if we play a little bit legal twist how whenever we are taking a consent make a column who else you other than you who is the patient we are authorized to communicate your personal and medical secret then he can write 10 names so now it is little bit of pinch of salt on that body if pre-operative investigation finds, it, you should not write this, but you should say this. If pre-operative investigation found that you are HIV positive, shall I divulge this to 10 of your relatives? If you say this as a surgeon, you will find number is zero. So there are mechanisms. We can actually do but point is that we are not geared up to implement this kind of things in our practice. But now days are changing, so we are also getting more legally correct. That's it for the research question. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Das. I think that answers his questions very well. Um, another question from Dr. Ved Prakash, who says, before, before buying surgery and... Uh, anesthesia equipment, why not buy the right gadgets for taking a proper consent that stands out in court? Consent is person and procedure specific. It cannot be carpet bombing. You make a format, <clears throat> do necessary changes for each patient, little line, thora line idha, thora line udha. but it should not be a standardized printed booklet. In most of the hospital, it comes with standardized printed booklet. Don't do this. Just a little bit of changes and do the same thing. Then it will look, it is person and procedure specific. Otherwise, it will look, it is standardized for everybody. Rightly answered. Uh, moving ahead, sir. My next question is from Dr. P.K. Goel. He says, what are the acceptable legal approaches for informed consent? That's why we have discussed throughout this session. Communication and documentation, if possible, make some e-things so that somebody cannot deny. And if you ask the patient to write something, it, it gives a lot of other things. Why actually these litigations happen? One portion is basically somebody is allergic to the doctor or it's a personal level rivalry after the patient's death or uh, unfavorable or not favorable recovery, whatever it is. That is a very minimal because 
if a doctor is sent behind the bar, he won't get anything. Even uh, he won't be able to even the lawyer's fee. But the same set of situation, it goes to CPA, Consumer Protection Act, Consumer Forum. He will get compensation, lawyer's fees, uh, whatever spent in the uh, in a medical treatment, everything he, he will get. So every case ultimately will go to the consumer forum. So we need mechanism uh, uh, how to curtail this. This consumer forum has a peculiar mechanism for calculation of compensation. There are two components as we discussed. Informed consent is informed is from the tort laws and consent is from the contract law. So surgery it has also two components when it is being calculated for any kind of compensation. Contract, it is very simple. Aapka kitna fees hua, hospital mein kitna kacha hua. Everybody can see that. Or whatever nobody is being able to understand, uska dard kitna hua. Uska kitna din hospital mein rahe ke dukhi rahena pada. So these intangible things actually covered by the tort laws. And it doesn't have any specific rule. It depends, it's a judge's disciplinary what they yeah. feel. And at the same time, if the patient died, it's, it will be calculated what is future earning potential. Say one young female uh, of 30 earning 2 lakhs rupees per month, if died for any reason. So compensation will be calculated. So 30 to average working age is 60. So next 30 years, she will be earning at least 2 lakhs rupees per month. The this will be taken into consideration how much the compensation is fine. Because by design, compensation is not anything award, reward, or punishment. It is just basically, as per the legal question, it is just to come, just to replenish the loss. It is not over and above the loss, not below the loss. So this line is absolutely intangible, and it is covered by the tort loss, and it is absolutely judge's discretion. Now the point is whether we can manage something to this calculation. Yes, we can manage. But it is very unethical to ask somebody, okay, please, aap, uh, aapka mahine ka salary kitna hai? We, we can extract this information. Just uh, other uh, business entities basically snatches the information from other things. How? There are very simple things. You make a chart and make one fancy fee for everybody. Say, for one example, one lakh, I will charge one lakh. And then, say, if your usual charge is 20,000, you slab it. If you are poor category, less than 15,000 per month, my fees will be 15,000. 20 to 50, my fees will be 18,000. You will calculate it. You will find most of the scenario, people will give a tick, which is the lowest. So whatever your usual fee, make that lowest. And whatever the highest bracket, make it a fancy one. Or write, it will be dependent on some other factors. Home category, uh, your city category, etc., etc., whatever. So it, there is no concrete rule. This is one mechanism, how the court is basically calculating. Now we have a document, this patient showed, say that uh, she has uh, earnings of 15,000 per month. So that is a wrong information. So it is a wrong information. It is in her part. So calculation cannot be considered in 2 lakhs rupees per month. There are mechanisms. So people are sharp. If something you you get with a lesser price, they will opt for that. It is simple. That's the reason many of the insurance insurance even capping things with the, with the various name of PPN etc etc. Even if you go by PPN rates, it differs from city to city. So you, you can do that. Yeah. <clears throat> no, makes makes sense. Um, so now I think um, there are two more questions both very similar in nature but uh, one of the questions is from dr parveen jindal says how valid is audio and or video consent um, in such cases uh, first thing is audio as a consent is never tried it, it can be tried 
audio video yeah it's it's good if it is uh, audio video recorded and it is very good it is acceptable as a document and only audio uh, it is very difficult then the question will be you prove whether it is or hard audio you, you send it to forensic lab then it is a very difficult thing to prove that but if it is video recorded with a crystal clear audio quality then definitely nobody can deny that okay i think just a follow up question to that uh, from dr choudhury is what is the legality and the need for video con consent as per law it's not mandatory okay consent is mandatory but how you are taking no where it is said that you have to take the video consenting mechanism it's never mandatory it's not yet in future what will happen i can't say at this moment as per indian law video consenting is not a mandatory but we do recommend if possible do a video consenting mechanism and make things or technology available so that sound is very clear to uh, clear and audible to everybody because it will if it requires actually it will require down the line 2 3 years later so you, not only you have to record it you have to preserve it in a proper way right you said um there has been one more question which is more like um, so the what are the efforts to strengthen the doctor patient relationship uh, let patients and relatives develop faith in doctors now given the case of consent and the various medical legal you know if um, cases that have been coming up what is your say on that uh, relation whenever somebody has a overlapping zone with anybody only the relation do exist so somebody who is coming to a doctor always in a stress at some point of time there was a heavily weightage of the doctor say now in the world of consumerism everybody thinks i am the best or i want the best so it, it, it is now it's a myth uh, don't go by your personal feelings or personal judgment be professional and i do believe professional is the quality of doing the right thing at right time in a right way having the right outcome and to have a relation uh, if you want to play or plug in your mobile charger it's with the male plug so you need a female point in your switchboard otherwise you can't do this so it you, you reshape yourself according to the requirement and time if you go to to uk or usa the charging points are different so it has to be in your travel bag if you don't take it and then rone lag gaya kya kare kya kare बाहर निकलो बाजार से खरीद के लाओ पर यू 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 कैन नॉट चेंज द चार्जिंग पॉइंट्स ऑफ होल यूरोप इट्स नॉट पॉसिबल सो इट इज बेटर टू चेंज द होल सोसाइटी द एफर्ट्स एंड टाइम एंड एनर्जी यू विल रिक्वायर इट इट इज मच मोर इजीयर फॉर योरसेल्फ टू जस्ट चेंज योरसेल्फ अकॉर्डिंग टू द टाइम इट इज माय सजेशन ओके थैंक यू सो मच डॉक्टर दास दीस वर ऑल द क्वेश्चंस वी हैड सो नाउ अम um closing this session for today uh, thank you so much for you know having um uh, being with us here and you know uh, giving out such an insightful lecture for our doctors also to the audience thank you so much for so many questions and it was lovely uh, having you all watch these sessions today exclusively on doc texas and we'll be back with such clinically rich and also medical legal topics have been really really in demand uh, by our users as well So thank you so much, Dr. Das, for making. Thank you, Rashika. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a very good evening. Good evening. Thanks.